Hi everybody, I'm Matthew Leonard, Executive Director of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and you can see again I have my great friend Mike Aquilina uh, with me, and this is part two of our two-part series on a couple of the Cappadocian Fathers, and Mike is our treasure trove of information, and he's written an obscene number of books. <laughs> His latest obscenity, again, is <laughs> Yours is the Church, How Catholicism Shapes Our World, and it is fantastic stuff, and of course you can find it at the St. Paul Center website. Last time we talked about Basil the Great, now we're going to move on to Gregory of Nazianzus, and we talk about them together because they share the same feast day. Uh, but these guys, uh, these Cappadocian fathers, they were buddies, they were. two of them were brothers, but it wasn't just that relationship that kind of solidified uh, them as a unit, because they had some very serious shared concerns mm -hmm. as well. What were they? Well, Basil and Great had a shared life. Uh, from, from early on when they were doing their studies in Athens. They lived together, they studied together, they, they, they kind of lived an ascetical life together, and they gradually underwent a spiritual transformation together. They, they, uh, they adopted a, a profound way of living Christianity. Uh, and, and I think they were drawn to the ascetical life and a life of uh, contemplation and study around the same time. Uh, it's interesting, Gregory was, was the, um, the, the older of the two. Uh, but Basil was definitely the, the more forward of the two, and, uh, and, um, and they, 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 they had very different temperaments, very different personalities. Um, uh, Gregory's more the, the, the stereotype of the contemplative. He was introverted. He liked to be alone. He really wanted to live a, a fairly solitary life in seclusion. Uh, Basil was, was drawn to, uh, to the contemplative life, and he, he enjoyed it. Uh, while he had it, but he was he was propelled from there out into the world of action, out into uh, to the active life of a priest first, and then a, an auxiliary bishop, and finally finally bishop of a very large and influential diocese. But how did that happen? Because he didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? And what's his family background? Because it's a little bit unusual. Well, yeah. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Basil was drawn was drawn out first to become a bishop, and uh, Gregory was kind of, uh, uh, well, well, uh, you know, it happened in stages to poor Gregory, and and poor Gregory, who was a fairly passive and uh, and as I said, introverted person, uh, had things done to him over and over again in his life, and what happened first was that his father, um, who was a bishop in Nazianzus, uh, called his son uh, up to help him. And so, so Gregory went up to help his father. And you have to understand, his father was a convert to the faith and a bishop of the, the generation of fighters, okay? So he was consecrated as a bishop the same year as Athanasius of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the Athanasius was the great opponent of the major heresy of the time, Arianism. And he was, you know, you often hear the, the slogan, it was Athanasius against the world. And that's almost true. But he did have other bishops who were on his side, like the elder Gregory, the father of, 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 of our Gregory. And, and Gregory's dad was a fighter too. Now, the difference was that he wasn't as brilliant as Athanasius. Um, Gregory Sr. was not the brightest bulb on the tree. And every now and then, he got hoodwinked. And actually, at one point, he actually was, um, was hoodwinked into signing an Arian creed. They just fudged the language a little bit, and he didn't understand it very well. So after he got taken once, he felt very insecure in his position, yet he wanted to promote Nicene Orthodoxy. So he called his son up. While his son was there, he forcibly ordained him to the priesthood against his will. And this was an act of violence that, that the younger Gregory really never got over, and he ran away. He ran away. Now, when he ran away, he ran away to his friend Basil, who did not give him aid and comfort, really, and, 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 and told him, listen, you're a priest now. You've got to go back, and you've got to serve. And so he did go back, and he, he, uh, he gave this, this great oration when he got back, explaining himself. And it's one of the great works of autobiographical literature, one of the earliest works of autobiographical literature. It precedes even Augustine's Confessions. And I would say that it's part of the same movement Christianity makes possible confessional literature, autobiographical literature, which you never have in history before that. Everything that's done before that is not realistic. It's more self-aggrandizement. This is different. 
explain something to us because some of our viewers are going, wait a minute, you have a bishop who's the dad of this guy. What was, the, how did that work back then? So he was obviously married. Yes. And Gregory's his son. What was the, the commonplace practice for when someone who was married became a bishop at that point in time? Uh, the way it developed was that, you know, you, you find in the New Testament that St. Paul says that a bishop should be married only once, right. you know, and should, should have good control over his household. Um, uh, in these times when the church was still fairly small in some places, especially the Nicene Orthodox community was pretty small in some places, um, uh, that many of the bishops were taken from, uh, from the ranks of married men, older married men, proven men, proven Christians. Orthodox Christians. Um, what would often happen in these cases is that they would then live a celibate life within marriage. They would live as brother and sister with their wives. Okay. Now, you mentioned some of Gregory's strengths. But, so, first of all, he was kind of an introvert. He wasn't like Basil. But what were his, you know, what were his real strengths? What were his gifts that he brought to bear then? Rhetorical brilliance. He really did have an amazing education, great training, and he put the classical tradition of rhetoric to use for uh, Christian preaching and Christian poetry, really, uh, in, in his generation, really, though. He was, he was the guy who was um, the pioneer in this, th these areas, uh, taking the riches of, of the, the classical tradition and applying them uh, to the Christian uh, situation. Uh, that was one. The other one was theological brilliance. He really did have a mind for philosophical subtlety and, and the ability to apply uh, the, 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 the terminology of the philosophical tradition to the particular problems that the church was facing at that time. So the church is trying to develop a vocabulary for discussing the truths that are revealed in Scripture. How do you talk about this? Well, he had to develop the vocabulary that deals with personhood, essence, substance, all of these things that were a little fuzzy in the classical tradition, he had to turn the lens on the camera and make them crystal clear for the discussion of who Christ is and, and what Christ is. So he's creating the fundamentals basically for the doctrines that we just kind of believe and don't even know really what the origin is. He's that's that's right. And tradition so revered his way of doing this that he becomes one of only only two men up to that time who are referred to as the theologian and the other one is John the evangelist. Wow. You know, in the east they call him John the theologian. Well, he's known as Gregory the theologian. He's honored as one of the three hierarchs of the Eastern Church. In the west we honor him as one of the four great uh, Eastern Fathers, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and according to tradition in the East, he is the only theologian who never wrote a single sentence that, that aired theologically. Wow. Well, you stole my last question with that uh, last soliloquy, so we'll wrap it up here. <laughs> but uh, thank you again, as always, thank Mike. You, Matthew. I'm sure we will have you back. I'll, 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 I'll take that invitation. Great. Again, uh, if you're looking for resources to grow in your faith and love of our Lord, please go to SalvationHistory.com. Check us out on Facebook. Go take a look at the YouTube channel. There's a lot of other videos that, that are up there as well. You can also get Dr. Hahn's uh, Sunday Reflections on the Mass readings. Just go to SalvationHistory.com and you can sign up to receive those in your inbox on a monthly basis or you can contact the center and get those mailed to you as well. God bless you guys.